I'm DDP Try, Vice Regent for the great state of Wisconsin, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the Ford Evening Book Box and, and to introduce tonight's speakers. Now, George Washington is not exactly known for his sense of humor. But I have it on good authority, Washington gets a bad rap. Close friend David Humphreys reported that Washington, and I quote, relished made sly jokes while barely, and I quote again, suppressing a smile. It is indeed Washington and not Mark Twain who first humorously noted in 1755 after fighting with General Braddock that the report of his death was exaggerated. And it is Washington who, when attending a Dutch Reformed church, joked that he was by no means in danger of conversion since he understood not a word of German. <laughs> it should come as no surprise that in 1786, Washington wrote to his friend Theodoric Bland that it is assuredly better to go laughing than crying through the rough journey of life. In this sentiment, if nothing else, George Washington and Alexander Petri have much in common. I cannot tell a lie. Alexander Petri has been enjoying history since her earliest days. I'm her mother. Uh, and tonight's book is the product of years of fascination with history. Much of it inspired, for better or for worse, by this great place, Mount Vernon. By the age of five, Alexandra had dutifully been dragged to Mount Vernon, Berry Ferry Farm, and Fort Necessity. Early in life, she received Liberty the Cat from the Mount Vernon gift shop and served as the guinea pig for the Mount Vernon discovery map, being debuted by the Mount Vernon Founders Committee. When other children received toys and books on birthdays, Alexandra received certificates for Mount Vernon shingles and membership in the Society of Indiana Pioneers. While others dressed as transformers and princesses for Halloween, Alexandra donned costumes dedicated to historic figures, Winston Churchill with a cigar, and John Adams, who I might add the great citizens of Oshkosh mistook as Mozart. <laughs> By third grade, she had written her first historic novel, One Shining Star, about the Civil War. And in later years, she tried her hand at Civil War reenactment, coming home from the battlefield with two important realizations, that women were relegated to carrying water buckets and that ticks were a real and present danger. <laughs> Through it all, I can say that Alexandra has found friendship, comfort, stimulation, and humor in history. While many would say that history is no laughing matter, she would beg to differ. So it is tonight my great honor to introduce Doug Bradburn, our great scholar, our great leader here at Mount Vernon, and I also might add an occasional stand-up comic because he has to deal with an all-female board, <laughs> and my daughter, Alexandra Petri, who will discuss her new book, AP's U.S. History, All the Great American Documents I Made Up. I promise you, this is history like you've never read before. <laughs> Spectacular. Oh, thanks, Bob. <laughs> oh, yeah. A little physical comedy to start yeah. your evening. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, welcome to Mount Vernon. It's great to have you back. It's great to be here. And when was your first time here? <laughs> Probably in the womb, but certainly. <laughs> um, I, I do remember doing that map now that she mentions it yeah, adventure I think, map yeah we got to have my origin story just now <laughs> that pretty much yeah accounts for all of my uh historical interest is yeah what was in this river town did. but yeah i do remember the map and i remember i remember back before it used to be the house when the house, house was a different color it, it was like he, he thought it wanted to be white no oh, yeah no, it, Turns out he didn't. Turns out I, I just I, I do also love how you keep removing layers of paper and discovering that he had less and less taste, which I do feel like <laughs> <laughs> just a, a deck 
objective rule of history, like things were always less tasteful than you yeah. thought they were. Like the Greeks and Romans had everything was like purple and gold and you know. Well, it's like when you look at old pictures of yourself from an earlier time and you ask yourself, what was I thinking, right? I yeah. Mean, Washington's just like that. But I mean, I must say, you, you must be a little disappointed that this book is, as you say, not endorsed by the college board here. I mean, is that, <laughs> is that a surprise for you that uh, this work was not going to be in the classroom? After all the laborious scholarship, all those hours I spent tramping around Mount Vernon, oh. battlefields, you know, reading the jungle, I was certainly hoping <laughs> that it would wind its way into the curriculum. So, yeah, I was I was a bit let down that the, these made up yeah. historical documents did not get to join the. Yeah, that's uh, a, it's a disappointing thing, clearly. Um, but, you know, you you have an issue. You have some issues with uh, some of our folks in the past here. Uh, what what is it about the pilgrims that uh, you don't like so much? <laughs> well, I do think anyone responsible for I, I just like as the first arrival, you want to have sort of a questionnaire to be like, would you describe yourself yeah. as a normal European? Like, is your vibe yeah. the same as the vibe of most people? who are coming here and the Puritans would be like, absolutely. And the answer would be like, no, in fact, they are, they just kept getting booted around for taking religion too seriously. And yeah, I like you, you have here, for instance, in this questionnaire, choose three of the following phrases to describe yourself. Sent because everyone back at home was so impressed, weird cultists, normal people seeking a better life, fun loving friends, or birders who have collected every European bird and want to see more and better birds. It's just good. Yeah, well, I think, or, you know, Vikings who got started late, also a possibility. <laughs> yeah, yeah that's, that's great. Yeah, why don't you read one of these uh, questions that you, you like here? Yeah, so like, for instance, is religion important to your life was one question, and their answers were either yes, it is everything, sure, but just the normal amount, normal being it's literally the only thing we think or talk about all the time, or no, my life means nothing without religion. So <laughs> yeah. a wide range of responses. <laughs> Um, yeah. but, and I also noticed that they left their anticipated departure date blank, which must have come as a bit of a disappointment to the people reading the survey. But so one of the, one of the things I want to do tonight with you all here, this uh, informed audience, and I have, you're a scholar of high renown who wrote a book. It's not just about pilgrims. It's just amazing, you know, because a lot of times I'm interviewing in a story and it's just about one thing, like one narrow slice. And so I want people to ask some questions and what we're going to do is, We'll have uh, circulation with cards and pencils on them. Write down any question about anything in American history, and she can answer it. Yeah, I won't answer it accurately, yeah. but I will answer it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, this is a great opportunity for us to have yeah. a scholar. Brett, it, what's right. It, what's it they say? Isaiah Berlin, where I think he said everyone's either a fox or a hedgehog, where the hedgehog knows one thing yeah. extremely well, and the fox knows a little bit about a lot of things. Well, I know about everything, but I know nothing about it. Yeah, so well, that's good. Which I think yeah. is the perfect amount. It's good to know a lot about stuff. And that's not what be Socrates right knew. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I liked your section on the Columbian Exchange as well. So I, as a serious professor, used to teach uh, European arrival to Americas through the Civil War, and you would always talk about the Columbian Exchange. Does everybody here know what the Columbian Exchange is in your textbooks? Oh, <laughs> okay, so, oh, well, this is a great opportunity. Yeah, was, uh, so why don't you tell, explain to them what the Columbian Exchange Well, was. I, it's sort of the, the, the handoff of goods and evils that happened when Christopher Columbus's expedition encountered the indigenous peoples of the Americas. Yeah. And so, you know, some items went one way and other items went the other way. Exactly. New kinds of food, new kinds of husbandry, all sorts of things went back and forth. Yes. I mean. Uh, I thought you, you, new kinds of husbandry was like a euphemism. And I'm like, <laughs> no. that's. Uh, yeah, no. But yeah. no, and I, unlike other exchanges, it did not have See, a return policy. That's like a George policy. Washington joke right there. He made jokes about animals and husbandry. That's what he did. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. So, is, so you're treating it like a proper exchange. Yeah, well, usually you, you can go to an exchange and say, I'd like my thing back because what I got was of less value. And so uh, I have somebody who's trying to, who, he brought a potato to the exchange and instead he got typhus and he doesn't feel that that's fair. Yeah, not Which a very is good not deal. fair, yeah. Because yeah. a potato, as, I, as he says, is a delicious rock that you can eat. <laughs> and, you know, it, it, if you go out in the street and one of you shouts, I have typhus and a potato, which one do you want? It's pretty clear which the response is going to be. Overwhelmingly, I think, pro the versatile and wonderful tuber yeah. and anti the uh, 
disease characterized by purple rash fevers and delirium. Yeah, well, let's ask this crowd. Would you rather have typhus or a potato? <laughs> I mean, I think you proved your point. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's pretty. It's a pretty bad exchange for some people. No, exactly, yeah. extremely, and that's that's the gist of the piece. Is that it's it's a very. Am I allowed to curse here? Uh, uh, I won't. Just in case, audience, yes, that's, I, mean, I won't. It's a bad exchange. <laughs> we'll say it's a. Yeah, it's a It'd poor be exchange. If you did curse, but probably less appropriate. Yes. So, so um, we'll, we'll go for less funny. Apparently, that's the move. Yeah. So so everything. Any question under the sun? Do we have some cards coming up? It, it's clear that you were you were at some point in a, a literature class. Yeah. Uh, who's your favorite American author in oh. the canon of American authors? Oh, that's so tough. Well, hopefully they make an I, appearance in here. Yeah, I think I really love Moby Dick, as you can yeah. tell from the fact that there's two Moby Dick chapters yes. yeah. instead of the one that would be standard. Um, <laughs> Well, it's it's the it's the added value that you're bringing. Yeah, and it's AP. funny. I was realizing you can use this in AP literature too. Yeah, know? exactly. It goes both ways. Um, yeah. so because I had sort of a one author I didn't really like was Nathaniel Hawthorne, but Herman Melville liked him, so I wanted to give him a fair shake. He was always going over and hanging out with well, Nathaniel called, you Hawthorne. You called him something, uh, Hawthorne Mr. Omu. Like a, yeah. No, you had him. It was like a sexy something. He's a good-looking such and such. Yeah. No, not Hawthorne. Uh, I, well, Hawthorne was. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hawthorne was like a looker yeah. for sure. He yeah. was like, yeah, noted Bowden Hottie. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Bowden Hottie. That's yeah. what he's called. Yeah. He and Franklin yeah. Pierce. And yeah. Hawthorne yeah. wrote a biography of Franklin Pierce, which I think Horace Eaton described as the greatest work of fiction Hawthorne ever penned. Uh, which, that's good. That's you a know, good one. it's both insulting to his regular works and insulting to the biography. So he really. I like that. He, yeah, that's the kind of history jokes you can expect from this book. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> they love but, yeah. yeah. No, I feel like usually when you have a crowd who's like, we're going to spend our evening enjoying a fake history textbook, you don't have to really work to, to be like, Nathaniel Hawthorne, let's introduce him as a concept. Like, yeah. they, they know what they bargained for, I hope. Yeah, well, exactly. Exactly right. Do we have any, any questions about any of American history from the audience? <laughs> Okay, well we'll wait. We'll wait till those start pouring in. Yeah. Uh, from the we can just do crowd. answers in a vacuum. Yeah. But why? So why? Yes. But why don't you like Moby Dick? You never said why you didn't like Moby Dick. Oh, I love Moby Dick. Moby uh, Dick is my favorite book. Uh, it's my favorite genre of book, uh, which is a book where there's kind of a plot, but mostly the author just wants to tell you fun facts about whales. Like, yeah. <laughs> and there aren't that many books that fall into that category, frankly. No. It's mostly just Moby Dick. Now that I'm no. saying it, but. Yeah, I guess Victor Hugo a little bit like that, where he'll stop the action and be like, I just want to tell you about the sewers. You know, Jean Valjean, he may be alive, he may be dead. I don't care. I want to tell you fun facts about sewers. And yeah. I love that. Why don't we do that anymore? Uh, so, it's a different century, the 19th century. A, yeah, lot plus, of, a lot of different things. Plus, he didn't really... I don't think the whale facts are accurate. That's what I also love wow. about the whale facts. He'd be like, some whales are like big books, and other whales are like little books. And it's all like Shakespeare. And it's like, yeah. I guess, Herman Melville, you were on this boat, so I would trust you. But I'm not going to go and fact check it. Although, I, I did hire a fact checker for yeah. this book. Yeah, what did they, uh, yeah. Which, how, did, how did they respond? Wait, they said, why? Uh, yeah. <laughs> what, are, what are you doing? Yeah, you, too many facts. It says on the cover, you made it up. Yeah. Um, I don't know what you're expecting from this, but I said, well, you know, the section where John and Abigail Adams are sexting, I want to make certain the letters are crossing the Atlantic in the right amount of time that it would take a letter to cross the Atlantic. And it you're turns out they were not. a scholar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's that kind of scholarship yeah, I love it. that sets this book apart. <laughs> All right, so, so we have some... This is a serious question now, okay? So who would you consider the worst president in U.S. history, excluding those still living? Oh, <laughs> to avoid any political discourse. Oh gosh, which yeah. Is, which is a required rule here. No politics. I mean, Buchanan was so bad, but Jackson was so bad, but Johnson was so bad. Ah, yeah, that was one of the choices. I didn't get to the. Oh, apparently, this is a. It's a multiple choice board. question. Yeah. Miller, oh, Fillmore or Johnson were your options. Oh yeah, so. I. You know. Millard Fillmore, I should know more about him other than that he inspired that one comic strip, Mallard Fillmore, which yeah. I think, you know, is enough to put him in the anti-column, but uh, <laughs> just because the pun is so bad. Um, you don't think Johnson gets a bad rap? I, 
I, that was a joke. I, <laughs> Come on. I I'm like, Jackson. You're the, sir, you're the historian. <laughs> Please don't surprise me with a new take yeah. on Andrew Johnson. I'm yeah, not prepared yeah. for it. <laughs> yeah, the revisionist book that, that rescues Johnson will be an interesting one to see. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, so where did you learn uh, the, the I truth? do feel bad for James Buchanan because Andrew Jackson used to be mean to him for bad reasons. I feel, I yeah. feel like Andrew Jackson, you know, already the worst boo boo yeah. andrew jackson can we get some boo yeah boo all right uh and he and he At least kept johnson could use the embroidered cushions you know from from jackson because the same initials that's true Jeez, yeah all right i'll leave the jokes up there he's the joke artist okay and Lin and lyndon like... johnson could use half of the cushion exactly yeah. minus Two, yeah. one of the, okay, I was trying to dive in there after you. Well, if um, we made that a requirement to choose presidents, it'd probably be a better way than we do it right now. If we just like pick one that has the same initials. Yeah, an we have president. only so yeah. many monogram towels yeah, and dishwares. Exactly. We can't. Robes. Yeah. All right, so here's a true fact that in your book that your fact checker no doubt found or was happy to, to confirm. Where did you learn the true fact that Tesla fell in love with a pigeon? I, you know, I don't even know what I was Googling when yeah, this came uh, up. Let's... I have to think, because yeah, Tesla, he had this very strange letter about how he loved this pigeon like a woman, as a man loves a woman, and that when she left him, the light went out of his life. And like, he's like, I loved her. Yes, I loved her. And I just, I think this is just one more piece of evidence that Tesla was not surrounded by friends who had his best interests at heart <laughs> that he that they let the thing with the pigeon go on for yeah. such a long time because yeah, you have to tell your friends when there's a problem with their relationship yeah usually if your friend is getting like catfished or you know in his case i guess pigeon pigeon fished <laughs> pigeon bird bird fished um we'll, we'll workshop it um yeah. he like, you you want to say something at some point yeah. and clearly no one said anything to tesla and i guess edison was thought this would distract him from <laughs> While, while he pulled all the patents out. Tesla seems like a hard guy to talk to, in honest. All right. So have there been any U.S. senators more violent than cane wielding Texan ropes? And should the Senate bring back cane fights? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think no is what I will say to bringing back cane fighting in the yeah. Senate. Although I do think, like, Maybe they could get a sponsorship sort of deal. I mean, I, I'm team like, why don't we let the Supreme Court just be sponsored? Like, mm -hmm. just, you know, <laughs> they're all in there to the death. Like, yeah. let them be, yeah, you know. Good. I think they'd like that too. Their salaries would go up for sure. Yeah, I know. It's clear that, like, the billionaires don't know what to do with all their money. They're, yeah. they're, it's stressing them out. And, but they yeah. often are cheered up by having the Supreme Court justice around. So just open it up. Use capitalism. Anyway, um, so <laughs> where it. was I? Oh, yeah, no, sponsored cane fighting. That's what I was going to say. The Senate, we can help fix the debt ceiling. We can just have, yeah, sponsor your senator. I love it. But with a soft cane. Um, oh, no, or Tim Kaine. Tim, uh, uh, there you go. That's really good. Speaking of puns, uh, you have a Where's Walden situation oh, yes. here. Not Where's Waldo, but there's a picture. Where's Walden? Yes. You can find the men, the massive men living a life of quiet desperation um, because they're saying shh and they're squeezed yeah. together. Um, that's how you can tell they're a mass. There's also a guy sitting on a pumpkin uh, who is happy, which Thoreau was always insisting you could find. Well, another true fact you include here, which always struck me after I found out about it, which I didn't know when I read it in high school, was that Walden's mother would do, or not Walden, Thoreau's mother did his uh, laundry for him. Yeah, I feel like there has been like more discourse about this, but yeah, she would keep coming by with the laundry. And I'm like, well, it's easy to live yeah. in independence and solitude, totally yeah. dependent on no man if your mother is bringing your laundry. Yeah. Um, so... Yeah, not exactly the survivalist of the, the, the modern route here. All right. Okay. Now, a lot of people say that they can't read Moby Dick because it's so uh, difficult and very long. Uh, what do you love about it other than what you already said? I guess I already yeah, asked well, this question. Yeah, mostly well, just... It's got two chapters, so you have to answer it twice. Yeah. He, well, I love how he keeps interrupting you with whale facts. I love at one point it just switches into dialogue. And I also like as I say in the book, that somebody builds a coffin, which feels like just a very dramatic gesture, and then it turns out to come in handy later, which, yeah. <laughs> which I love it. Like, you've gone out of your way to construct yourself a coffin, and then it actually comes back and 
people say, no, he was right to do that. That was that was the sane move in this scenario. So the plot is hard to find in that book occasionally. Well, yeah, so is the whale. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's it, right? But I mean, you might have just put your finger on the whole thing, right? Yeah. There. I think that's really good. I got a good question here, which is going to be you know, this is a tough one. Best historical nicknames. Ooh. They get me old rough and ready and old fuss and feathers. I love old fuss and feathers. Yeah. I think that's the best one. Whenever I pass the statue of Winfield Scott in his circle, I think, oh, this guy. See, she knew Winfield Scott. Old fuss and yeah, old fuss and feathers. The Anaconda plan. The this, Anaconda this man plan, knows exactly. what he's talking about. So yeah. He was a Virginian. Had some good ideas. Yeah. Um, and but I do also like Tippy Canoe. I think that's a fun. Yeah, and Tyler too. And Tyler like too. Yeah. yeah, best campaign song, with a possible exception of "Little Know Ye Who Is Coming," the John Quincy Adams attack campaign song, <laughs> which is great. It's like "Little Know Ye Who Is Coming" if John Quincy not be coming, and then it just proceeds to rhyme for like half an hour. It's like famines coming, yeah. famines coming, yeah, pestilence good. and knives are coming if John Quincy not be coming, and. <laughs> Well, rhyming was a big thing in the 19th century, as you point out, right? Yeah. Uh, one that... of our favorite poets here, the only one with a uh, a, 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 a monument in Poets' Corner in, yeah. in, in London. So um, No, and that's why we only know about Paul Revere and don't know yeah. about anyone else who was involved in his ride, because their yeah. names don't rhyme yeah. as well. Yeah, I thought you. it was great that you found the rough draft of that poem, yes. I thought. Why don't you share, share some of that yeah. with us? Listen, my children, and you shall hear of the midnight ride of Paul Revere on the 18th of April in 75. Hardly a man is now alive who remembers that famous day and year. But ere we very much further go, another fact that you ought to know, a fact I'm not hesitant to reveal, a fact I make no effort to conceal, is that also along for the ride that night, a ride that history keeps in sight, was someone named Samuel Prescott. <laughs> <laughs> I'm including him in the poem, too. It's important, you see, because of the two, he was the one who actually made the ride to Concord, where he bade the warning sound and the troops prepare. It was important that he was there. And I will not stint, let me now be clear, though his name is nothing like Paul Revere, a name that rhymes with so many things, a name with music that really sings, a name that rhymes with both deer and steer, a peer and beer, too, and also beer. You must admit, I am sure this man makes it so easy to rhyme and scan. I could write Paul Revere odes all day, though I'm not biased in any way. But it is true that he's got a name well that quite well suits to poetic fame which is not a thing I could say as well of a man whose name is a funeral knell when it comes to rhyming, not what we've best got. You know the man I mean, Samuel Prescott. <laughs> <laughs> you have any more? Yeah. I, it, yeah. it continues in that vein for some time. <laughs> <laughs> like the actual poem. Yeah, yes. yeah, exactly right. Yeah, the rough drafts of things are, are wonderful. So here's a, here's a financial question. Oh. So put your thinking cap on. Uh, was the Louisiana Purchase a good investment? I I think it's it's nice that we have Louisiana, so I'm going to yeah. say yes. yes. And, and yeah. all the all points west. All the rest, not the Big South Mountain, but what the, could we have bought instead? Though is the question. I guess we could have bought Alaska earlier, mm -hmm. um, yeah. and maybe it would have accrued, and then we could have bought more. I don't know how the. <laughs> I'm very good at finance. It's yeah. clear from this, yeah. um, but no, I guess we could have. Maybe we could have bought some ocean. I don't know how that would have helped, but you know, it really would have thrown the Brits off. They would have been like, we're doing all this naval power, but I hear they own the ocean now. Um, yeah, this is... You never know what would have been for sale and on, on, on offer after Louisiana wasn't there. So uh, yes, and Jefferson was liable to buy anything. So who knows? Uh, probably a vineyard somewhere. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay, so... Um, First of all, there's not a lot of George in this book. I mean, let's be honest. But you put him on the cover because you know he sells. Well, exactly. Right? But you, you also put yourself on the cover. Now, here's a trivia question for you. Do you know who you replaced in this famous washing, George Washington crossing the Delaware, although it didn't have big cherry pie ice floats in it? <laughs> I think Monroe? Yes, yeah, there you Did go. I President Monroe. Monroe. Oh, cool. oh. Yeah, there you I'm, go. Look at that. I prepped See, for trivia. this, yeah. It's good. You must win a lot of trivia. You do trivia in bars. I do. I, I used to more before I had a 16-month-old. Yeah. Uh, 
Well, and it's a job of, probably. Yeah. yeah. No, <laughs> it's nice to go after your job before your child to to a bar and do bar trivia. Yeah. But well, that's true. Although it can, it can consume your life, and yeah, it's. Now you grew up uh, in the house of one of the ladies of Mount Vernon. I did. Uh, and I also believe, that maybe I'm incorrect, your grandmother was also a, yes. a, a Mount Vernon Ladies Association. Uh, yes, many, lady. many generations of George Washington fanciers in, yeah. the, in the house. Yeah, so do you have a lot of portraits in, of George Washington in the house growing up? We, we sure did. My go-to joke was always that if George Washington got murdered and you came to our house and you looked around, you'd be like, oh, this woman did it. <laughs> because there is just so many pictures of George Washington in the house. There's plates with his face. There's fans with his face. There's cushions. There's a dog toy, I think. Um, yeah. There's all kinds of George Washington paraphernalia. But no, and every Christmas we would watch this wonderful uh, Barry Bostwick film. Yeah. Uh, every Christmas. Pretty much it felt like every Christmas if it wasn't yeah. every Christmas. Uh, and it was, what if Barry Boswick from Rocky Horror Picture Show fame was George Washington at every stage of his life? That's great. And point. it was on CBS. Jacqueline Smith played George Washington's forbidden love interest. Yes. Um, and they had a beautiful theme, which I can still hum for you now, but won't. Go ahead. Uh, do, 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 <laughs> yes. do. Anyway, and yeah. uh, pa Patty Duke. <laughs> Patty Duke was Martha Washington. And they really went through it. It turned out George Washington had did did all kinds of things like he started the seven years war and just yeah. real just mind-blowing stuff that he was up to but uh no it was a family tradition and so i learned it's one of those things i think that helped inspire the book where i learned facts and then i also learned things that were e even more than facts and they all got mixed up in there so <laughs> well, that's perfect yeah that's uh that is a fun mini series and speaking of the founding you do have washington you know what i liked is you discovered some more notes from the constitutional convention yes you know one of the things that's frustrating for historians is you got madison's notes and then mary built it a great book it showed that madison edited his notes like 30 years later but what's great about your book is you found more notes yeah. from other people at the convention. So yeah, you, I found, you could share some of, some of that with us. Mostly the notes where Governor Morris is complaining yeah. that Madison's the only one taking notes. And, yeah. and Madison clearly has it out for him and is writing all these things in the notes about how he's got the wrong number of legs, which seems unnecessary <laughs> of Madison. Um, and so, yeah, General Washington is expressing, once again, his sense of the enormous burden that has been placed on his shoulders, unworthy though he is, and vowing to discharge his grave responsibility with all the skill that lies within his power. He's stressing the sentiment very much. And he, he keeps saying that throughout the, <laughs> throughout well, Washington the event. Washington keeps coming back. And meanwhile, Franklin yeah. is taking notes. And so he's got his own notes. And they say, like, Alexander Hamilton spoke at length on his idea for a new form of government, room very hot, Strange humming and buzzing suggests new idea for musical instrument. <laughs> List of things one might make harmoniums out of besides glass. Metal, perhaps? Wood polished to a sheen? Things to do. Respond to admirer's letter. Disown son. Have hat mended. <laughs> so he got distracted, I guess, and didn't keep yeah. going with his low Franklin notes. Franklin, admittedly, was older at that time. Yeah. You know, so. And had a lot on his mind. It's going to be a lot of fan mail to deal with. Yeah. Discern from the text. Mm -hmm. um, and then Elbridge Jerry notices that there's doodling going on and Governor Morris draws him as a lizard and Elbridge Jerry says, that would be a great shape for a congressional district. Um, <laughs> and while all this distraction is going on, the, the chair asks if they had any ideas for a better system of voting than an electoral college and nobody says anything. So that's yeah, yeah. very, very sad. <laughs> How that wound up happening. Yeah, you never know about the distractions in the room until yeah. these notes you discuss. Yeah, really... no. We, we knew it was hot, but we didn't know no. in granular detail. Well, I liked how Governor Morris kept telling Madison that you suck, and Madison wouldn't write that in his notes. Yeah, Madison would just say, Governor my... Morris said he respected me um, and that I looked nice in my little hat. Yeah. <laughs> Is my mic out? Are you all hearing me through the mic? It comes and goes? Well, yeah. this will be great to be online. Yes. Just assume uh, we're crushing it on yeah. online audience. <laughs> so I'll laugh a minute. Okay. All right. So who had a bigger impact on American politics? I'm doubling duty here. Uh, Tom Lair, Mark Russell, or Capital Steps. Oh. Oh, that I 
I'm a big Tom Lair fan, and he taught me all the periodic table of the elements. So I'm going to say Tom Lair, but I, I miss both of the others. Um, Is Capital Steps defunct? I haven't seen them in I, years. I, I thought they weren't funked. Yeah. Um, <laughs> they they if, should use funk. They'd if if they had been funked, yeah, yeah. They, they, they're no longer. Who is the well, there's one. who will be the next star of American political musical comedy? Oh, I feel like well, Randy Rainbow is making a good showing right now. <laughs> so he's going on tour. Check it out. A free promo for Randy Rainbow. You're welcome, Randy Rainbow. Um, but since Stephen Sondheim isn't around to promote him, I have to do my best. Um, Who is the funniest uh, president? I, I think Calvin Coolidge was actually sneakily very funny. No. He had a sort of a trademark dry wit, uh -huh. uh, you know, that famous thing where somebody sat down next to him at dinner and said, I, I bet my friend I can make you say three words tonight. And he goes, you lose. <laughs> which, yeah, of course, Dorothy Parker, when he died, said, how can they tell? Which was funnier. That's good. That's but <laughs> no, I'm trying to think who else was. Well, Benjamin Harrison was kind of funny, just his existence. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, he was the 23rd president, served between Clevelands, which was a, such an important thing to do, and especially at that time, as Donald Trump said of Abraham Lincoln. Uh, probably my favorite historical quote describing anything that's happened in the past. Abraham Lincoln did something that was very important to do, and especially at that time. <laughs> Well, he, he thought Douglas was doing really great yeah, things. Yeah, more and more, <laughs> contributing more and more. So, but yes. yeah, Abraham Lincoln was very funny, and he had that great story about the farting carver. Yes. Oh, can I? Uh, yeah, this is a crowd that will enjoy the Abraham Lincoln's farting carver story. Yes, so, please. You want to hear the farting carver? <laughs> farting carver. Yes. So, Abraham Lincoln. Uh, he said there was this one man who was known for being quick of wit and very dexterous and skillful. And at one point, he's carving a turkey and as he sets out to carve the turkey he lets loose an enormous fart and the whole company falls silent they stare at this man they wonder what is this guy going to do and so they watch him and he with great coolness rolls up his sleeves sharpens his knife and sets himself again to his task and he says now let's see if i can't carve this turkey without farting <laughs> i just <laughs> Abraham Lincoln had jokes. Yeah, that's and, and that's the one that did. Tony Kushner didn't steal for Lincoln because the one about the outhouse he really told that one. Yes, he but did. Yeah, yeah. He, he also did. told this one, and somehow Tony Kushner was like, "This one is not as good as the outhouse one." But yeah, maybe you had to be there for the <laughs> for that one. Uh, all right, more questions. Bring them up. What do we got out there? Let's keep this moving. Let's keep it hopping. Let's keep it happening. Um, what is your favorite? Uh, 20th century historical anecdote. Ooh, well, I love anything and everything to do with Alice Roosevelt. I just think she is a real party. Okay. Uh, yeah, just because Teddy Roosevelt famously said of his daughter, I can be president of the United States or I can control Alice. I can't do both. <laughs> and, so, but they called her Princess Alice and she had her debutante ball in the White House, even though it, it hadn't been updated, the furnishings since like the Grant administration. So he, he described it as like late Grant, early Pullman, which I guess <laughs> was a really good insult at the time. And I just think everything about her, but her best friend is actually, so she was best friends briefly with someone named Marguerite Cassini who was the illegitimate daughter of the Russian ambassador. And they were the two girls who kept getting seated at like the heads of tables, despite being, you know, in their early, late teens, early twenties, ahead of all these congressmen's wives who were, you know, very staid and put together. And Marguerite wrote the most bananas autobiography I've ever read in my life. It was called Never a Dull Moment. And her, check it out, because her, her son, uh, one of her sons was Jackie Kennedy's stylist. And the other one wrote the Knickerbocker column for the, New York, one of the New York newspapers. Uh, it was Charlie Knickerbocker. Anyway, but getting into the weeds on Marguerite, every single page, something completely wild happens to her. At one point, she's like being pulled in a sledge across Siberia, and her mother loses her operatic singing voice. And then on another page, she's about to jump off a cliff, and Field Marshal Falk of France stops her. It just, anyway, it's great. Google Marguerite Cassini and, and read her books, because she's, she's a hot ticket. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, it, she's not in here, though. No, because oh, okay. uh, well. it, it would it would have sounded made up. Everything right. it, it it may have been made up. It's one of those. Well, a lot of this sounds made up in here. Yeah. So that might have been what you were going for. It, That's true. 
but... what is the teapot dome? Oh, who, uh, who knows what the teapot dome crisis is here? Five people. Oh and, no, and I think two of their friends. Everyone's okay. everyone's thickly so gathered. Pretend this is an AP U.S. history class, and they need to prepare for the exam. And the teapot dome scandal is going to be on there. What would you say? To well, the teapot dome is one of those classic things where where you become in a position of power, and suddenly it turns out that you have this fascinating personality, and people want to give you money, and. You know, you thought I was thought I was just Albert B. Fall, Secretary of the Interior. I didn't realize that I, you know, should be given tons of money and made much of by all these tycoons. But it turns out that it, it because they wanted to drill in land that he protected, and so he gave them the drilling rights to one of the funnily named Teapot Dome areas. Uh, and then after the scandal came out, they were like, it wasn't a bribe. It was just a loan. And then he became bankrupt and died. Um, <laughs> but yeah, Pan American Petroleum and Transport Company uh, claimed it was an interest-free loan that they'd given him. But the damage had been done. I think mostly the mistake was the name was too good for the oil reserve. Yeah. And when you have a good name for a scandal, those tend to go further than like if it just been like the generic patch of land yeah. oil reserves. I don't think it would have had the legs that Teapot Dome had. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. Teapot Dome, Wyoming. Fantastic. All right. So uh, here's, a here's a good question from the audience. Where did Amelia Earhart disappear to? Well, I – so – I did some Googling and somebody has a theory that she is currently a housewife in New Jersey, mm. which I'm like, that's fascinating. Yeah. I didn't know she lived that long. Um, Maybe she lives with Frederick Douglass. All right. Yeah, her, so, well, what contributions is, being recognized more and more. What is your favorite first lady story? My favorite first lady story. Ooh, I do like that. Caroline Harrison, Benjamin Harrison's first wife, before he married her niece, which they deny oddly on the tour of his house. They do. They go out of their way to be like he didn't have an affair with his wife's niece, which I feel like I would simply not say that if I were, <laughs> if I were doing the tour, I would just take, you know leave it as assumed. Yeah. <laughs> we love the tour guides of the Benjamin Harrison house. No, we do. They're if wonderful. Go see the Benjamin Harrison presidential it's site. It's wonderful. But no, it's incest, but it's not. No, possible. no, no. Uh, it, it's a great tour. And I, I just felt like it was odd that they needed to go out of their way to say that they hadn't had an affair because uh, it wouldn't have crossed my mind. Well, but, sometimes you want to, you know, you want to answer these questions before they're asked. Yeah. Uh, you no, know, it's like one time I, uh, as a child, we were on like an outdoor tour and the guide there said, now be sure. I know that squirrels have the perfect sized body to kick, but don't kick them. I'm like, well, it never occurred to me that they had the perfect sized body to kick. But now all I want to do is kick a squirrel. Yeah. And I feel it's analogous what happened at the Benjamin Harrison house. Yeah. But he spoke it into existence. No, so his wife, though, Her Caroline Harrison, before she died uh, and he married his niece, I don't know why I keep harping on this. Sorry, Benjamin Harrison. Before she died, she was going to completely redo the White House with palms and statues and put in sort of like more of a, like more a, a Mar -a Caesar's Lago Palace vibe. Look? Yeah, Mar a Lago, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So it could have happened. Yeah. Well, you know, but, ahead of his time. Ahead of her time. Okay, who, who's the most underappreciated first lady and why? I So I'm just going to arbitrarily say Lemonade Lucy Hayes, but I think that's yeah. wrong. Um, it could be William Henry Harrison's wife, whoever that was. Yeah, it's, that's uh, just a flash in the pan. Yeah. The 28 days, no incidents, so. I mean, it was a long inauguration. Yeah. No, but she should have told him to put on a jacket, I think. A hat, uh, at least. A yeah. hat, yeah. Uh, who would you, oh, who historical figures would you want to have dinner with? Oh, this is fun. This is a classic. Historians get this all the time. And now that you are an esteemed historian, yes. you got to get used to answering this. Yeah, I'm curious who your answers are as well. No. Uh, it's, not a, it's not about me. It's not about me. Please. No, because I think sometimes you just want to see people fight. But I would, I would yeah. kind of like... I think it would be fun to get like Herman Melville, maybe Mark Twain, Here we go. just some people who like Mark Twain recently had a book come out, which I think is impressive given how long he's been dead. Um, yeah. But I think if he, you know, if you could get him into your dinner, you could lock the doors and say, write more books, Mark Twain, and then you could make a lot of money. Yeah. Um, I, I think, yeah, my scheme is just get a bunch of authors and lock them in the room and force them to write you know, they just keep having food like come. That. Yeah. So it's the, the dinner AI. doesn't end. And then you get a lot of 
yeah, new Emily Dickinson. When was the last time we had a new Emily Dickinson? It's been a while. So yeah, get Emily Dickinson and Mark Twain and uh, I don't know, get Herodotus in there. Although, do they have a translator? Because otherwise it'd be sort of awkward for Herodotus sitting there, yeah. you know. It's all Greek to me. Yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, it wouldn't Come be. On. Yeah. I mean, I can't keep up. I can't keep up with her. She's too fast. Uh, craziest president was another question. Who's the craziest president? Uh, only dead presidents. Oh, I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I know. President, 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 company excluded. Um, I think Alice Roosevelt famously said about Teddy that he wanted to be the cor the bride at every wedding and the corpse at every funeral, and I like that. So I'm going to say he was. The, but no, hang on. Who is actually? I mean, Franklin Pierce is sort of the sad answer to that. The gray-eyed man of destiny, they called him. Yeah. They did, I and mean, that's true. Yeah. Who's your fact checker? I, I I trust to know that you are right, but <laughs> yeah. you need to do version two and get the gray eyed man of destiny. In yeah, for sure. No, I think that'd be a good, I put that on a dating profile somewhere. Yeah. Are you in the great eyed, are you in the gray eyed man of destiny still together? It's like, well, I, I don't know. Uh, okay. Tough crowd tonight. Yeah. Come on. They don't like making light of Franklin Pierce. <laughs> no. They say he had enough having happening in his life. He did. He without did, us he had a, piling he had a on. Tough run for sure. Uh, you um, you have Edison has other ideas for Edison uh, to work on. You use the quote from Edison: "Genius is one percent inspiration and ninety nine percent perspiration." So you have a list. I, I assume this is Edison's list. Yeah, this is, this is yeah. just other ideas. I, I know that you he found had. this in his papers, discarded papers. So why don't you yeah. give us? Some of those. Uh, something you rub on yourself to make yourself sweat less. Uh, something you rub on yourself to make yourself sweat more. Uh, cool slogan about how sweating more is good for having ideas. 99% perspiration, you see? Yeah. See what she's doing here. God. A cooling device for the indoors. A bucket that dumps water on the person you're talking to so they also look wet and it's less noticeable how sweaty you are. <laughs> Warm woolen thing you can put on the body to encourage more sweating contest for who can have the wettest t-shirt that can become a known cultural phenomenon so that people will assume you could have multiple reasons for having a shirt that is wet. Moisture wicking t-shirt for a sweaty guy. Device to make you less frightened of things so that you can eliminate nervous sweat and just have regular temperature sweat. Winter. <laughs> Light bulb. <Yeah. laughs> Yeah, it's a it's a surprising list, uh, but I think it fits fits very very nicely. Now, um, you you grew up in the when the Cold War was still on. Uh, did I? I, I think uh, so. Yeah. I, I I think it had just ended when I got okay. here. Okay. I, I missed most of it. Yeah. Uh, most of the highlights. I think yeah, eighty eighty eight. The wall had come down, uh, and then I sh I showed up. Yeah. So, well, okay. Um, but I, I hear I it was quite cold, a There's not cold a lot of Cold War history in here. No, and that's because also when you're learning history, I feel like there's, at the very end, when you're approaching the exam, they suddenly realize that after lavishing many months on the period between 1763 and 1775, mm -hmm. suddenly it's crunch time and you don't know anything that happened after 1944. Yeah. And it's like, we, we don't even know how the war turned out. Yeah. Like, that'd be good information to have uh, <laughs> going into this AP. But... Um, <laughs> So then you very quickly skim. And so I, all that I know of like the Cold War sort of flashes or things that were in James Bond movies, I'm, I'm glad we solved that situation with the underwater, uh, you know, dome that they had. Yeah, they remade that twice, that movie. Yeah. Or the man who had his hat that he was throwing, it would, it would hurt you. Mm -hmm. That was a Soviet Odd innovation jobs, that I, I frowned on very much. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I, and I'm, it is funny in history classes they they get to you, you didn't I mean what I'm older than you they they never got to the Vietnam War uh, and uh, yeah no I think know. we had like one paragraph about everything that happened post two thousand where it was something like we think the internet's happening and also uh, nine eleven and that was and then the book was over and yeah. <laughs> yeah. so it was yeah now I hear now that. They they rush through the entire 19 teens and 20s, which would make sense because that's the history that's happened subsequently. Well, the, the teapot dome will be lost. 
Yeah, I, no I do one wonder one what it is. The t- <laughs> yeah. Even fewer people. Yeah. So are we going to do more history? Is this uh, the beginning of a series of historical approaches here? I mean, you may have found more documents out there. I think there's always more to be found. Yeah. yeah. I had a great time with this. So I think if, if people would read it, I would I would enjoy finding finding them. Yeah. Um, so, so okay, so let's, uh, this is exhausting, Alexander, to try to keep up with you, but uh, uh, so, so how, it must be difficult being a humorist in the climate we're in today. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, because I think one of the things that is the biggest challenge is that often things are absurd without being funny. Mm. And so, you, you know, if you just try to make them more absurd, it, it doesn't make them any funnier. It's just like, well, now I'm writing dystopian horror, which yeah. I did always joke that I wanted to, you know, write dystopian sci-fi horror, and now I don't have to quit my day job to do that. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. I'd prefer if I had to do that uh, to to quit my day job. That is, but <laughs> I do think it it is a challenge. But it's always been a challenge. I think any time when people have been trying to write humor, if you go back to like you know, Aristophanes, and he was sort of writing from the perspective of like, I don't know about this Socrates guy. Yeah. Maybe he's leading the youth astray. Maybe we should burn down his thinkery. And they, they did poison him. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. They canceled they Socrates. They canceled Socrates. Um, but, well, let's not have that happen to you. Yeah. yeah. Well, no, I, I fortunately, like like Socrates, I know nothing, but uh, unlike unlike Socrates, I'm not trying to instruct, oh no, I've, I've published a book to instruct <laughs> <laughs> my own petard. <laughs> But one thing I do like as a classicist is I feel there there used to be when you were writing a history, like if you were Herodotus or Thucydides, you could just start it with a disclaimer, like I wasn't at most of these events. And so I just made up speeches for the people who were there. <laughs> like Thucydides, he, like the Pericles funeral oration, he wasn't there for that. He just says, I came up with something that seemed like what you would say in a situation like this. And I'm like, where is this energy now? Why aren't more people <laughs> making up stuff? So well, th- uh, this book was uh, an opportunity to do that. Uh, it's a fantastic opportunity. Uh, you read some of the blurbs here. I mean, look at look at this one by Annette Gordon-Reed, Pulitzer Prize winner. Friend of Mount Vernon has won the George Washington Prize. Marvelously inventive, wickedly funny, extremely astute take on U.S. history. It's exactly what we need as we ponder the future of the American experiment and begin to prepare for the country's 250th anniversary. Aww. Yeah, well, there you go. Yeah, so I expect everybody to get multiple copies for yourself and your friends and your family and give them to humorless people and pretend like Yes, they're... yeah. No, I had a friend, she swears that one of her friends is a history teacher and bought this for her class and then realized it was made up. Um, <laughs> but I'm like, too good to check. So I, I hope that there's a class somewhere that I do think this is hopefully a book that will point you to want to learn more history so that you can nerd out with me about you know raymond chandler or whatnot yeah you're clearly a history nerd from the old school kind when i say the old school i mean from the petri family uh (laughs) ladies association kind and this is fantastic you look look you're amongst your people history nerds every as far as the eye can see here so congratulations it's really difficult to write humor and you've just done a phenomenal job and and what comes through is really this passion for u.s history uh, which is remarkable, insane, absurd, and a lot of fun. Exactly. Yeah. So get the book. She's going to have a chance to sign for everybody out front here. And thank you so much for coming this evening. Let's give her a big round of applause. Thank you, oh, thank you. This is a treat. Yeah. I'll, I'll take this back out for Maureen. Yeah. So Stephen's going to.